Welcome to Meet Your Local Heroes, a series of talented speakers in Charlotte, North Carolina. You'll meet specialists in health, finance, change management, sales, and more. Let's join our host, Phil Earhart, and meet this episode's local hero. Welcome to Meet Your Local Heroes. Joining us today is Gene Hoots. Hello, Gene. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Wonderful. Well, it's summertime in the Carolinas, and you know what that means. It means hot, humid weather is what it means. And Gene knows that because he is a native North Carolinian storyteller with over 50 years of experience in various aspects of financial analysis. Now, he has a plethora of stories from his experiences on boards of companies, charities, and clubs, along with his extensive travel and deep Tar Heel roots. Gene is also the author of Pay Attention to the Thin Cow, a collection of essays on investing and life experiences. His latest book, Going Down Tobacco Road, is a history of the North Carolina tobacco industry and the RJR Reynolds Tobacco Company. So, Gene, at this point in life, most men like you and myself are out playing golf or fishing or something. So tell us the why behind your decision you made to become a speaker and author. Well, the first thing is I never... <clears throat> had any interest in playing golf. And I guess that's one of the things that since I didn't have anything else to do, I wanted to occupy my time with something. And uh, I just retired um, the first of the year. And having written this book, I realized there was a market for more telling of stories about the tobacco industry, both through speaking and through a website, adding additional experiences every week or every two weeks about the tobacco industry. I've enjoyed doing doing that. And the reason I did this in the first place, the reason I wrote the book started about uh, 2015. I had been thinking for a number of years about the tobacco industry. It's a unique industry in many ways. And the main thing about it was its unique profitability. A study was done by three folks at the London School of Economics in 2015. They looked at the most profitable industries in both the UK and in America from 1900 to 2015, 115 year history. Not a big surprise, I guess. The biggest profitable industry in UK was the alcoholic beverage industry. In America, it was tobacco. And the numbers were astounding. They looked at the profitability of, a, of buying a basket of tobacco stocks in 1900 and holding them until 2015. That 115 year history, $1 invested in the tobacco industry in 1900 would have been worth, if you can believe it, $6.3 million in 2015. That doesn't sound possible, but the industry compounded at about 14 and a half percent a year for 115 years. And this was unique among American industries. If you look at it, think of the industries that came and went over that 115 year period. Uh, photography, the automobile, the airplane, airlines, the computer. All of these had their day, came and went. Uh, they became commodity products and they con didn't continue to be that profitable, but tobacco was uniquely profitable. And I wanted to tell the story of why that happened and what it meant to the state of North Carolina. That's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, you look at all the companies that are uh, that have basically been defunct now that were I mean, uh, companies like Kodak. Yeah. I mean, Kodak was was huge. I mean, in the photography business, I mean, and now it's basically copier or uh, printers and copiers and and chemicals i mean they people don't realize but kodak was also a major chemical provider mm -hmm. so when you go out and speak what do your audiences leave with after one of your presentations there are two audiences really for the material that i have and what i developed in a history of tobacco one of those audiences was a bit surprising to me. There are young people, young people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who are tobacco analysts around the world, and they're still interested in buying tobacco stocks. So to my surprise, this extensive background 
is of great interest to them because it gives them a feel for the history of the industry long term. The other audience is completely different. It consists of people who tend to be a bit older, but who, are, who have a nostalgia for the tobacco in North Carolina. They grew up here. They worked on a tobacco farm at one point. Their grandparents had a tobacco farm, or they may have worked in the industry for R.J. Reynolds or Brown and Williamson or American Tobacco. Uh, one of the things I cover are simply what's left in this state, what is here today that wouldn't have been here without tobacco, and a lot of people don't know it, is Wake Forest University and Duke University. Neither of those would exist without the gifts of major donations from R.J. Reynolds in Western Salem for Wake Forest and the Duke family in Durham for Duke University. Those are the kind of things that people are a little surprised to learn. And North Carolina, too, at one time was called the Good Road State. So a lot of the roads came from tobacco money, correct? Had to have been paid from tobacco money. There really wasn't any other source other than that. That, that is interesting. So, you know, one of the things that uh, I like to do on, on Meet Your Local Heroes is kind of give an audience a sample of your presentation style. So can you give us like a really short story for us? And one of my favorite stories is about a lovely little lady named Pauline Carter. And Pauline was a friend of mine. I didn't know her well. I had met her through my family. And she had worked for R.J. Reynolds for many, many years. She went there in 1926. She made about 10 cents an hour when she went to work there. She was a cafeteria worker and she worked <clears throat> for 35 or 40 years, I suppose. Took early retirement. And she said, I don't think she ever made more than $5,000 in pay any year that she ever worked there. But she said she saved her nickels and dimes and bought lots of R.J. Reynolds stock. And when the buyout came, she was distraught. And she called me and said, Gene, they're taking my stock. She looked at it as just taking the stock and she wasn't going to get anything for it. So I said, Pauline, let's talk about it. I said, uh, where are your shares of stock? And she said, they're in the trunk of my car down on Cherry Street. I went down with her. We brought them up to the office. Later, stack of certificates out on my conference table. We counted those certificates. She had 42,500 shares of rentals. It was trading at about $109 a share at that point. So she had well, well over $4 million lying there on my table. She lived in a tiny little home. It was nice and neat middle class neighborhood. She lived very frugally. And she said, now they're taking my rentals. And I said, well, Pauline, they aren't exactly taking it. You're going to get over $4 million for it. And she said, well, but I, I've got to have my dividend to live on. I said, well, you won't need the dividend anymore. At, at current interest rates, you're going to be making about $5,000 a week. And she said, well, how long before that runs out? And she thought in terms of principal and interest in going through it in a period of time. I said, Pauline, you don't understand. You've got $5,000 a week to spend. If you don't spend it next week, you got to spend 10,000 uh, or money's going to stack up on you. So it was, it was just a great, great eye opener for her. She finally grasped what she was doing and she sold the stock. She continued to invest. Pauline lived another 10 years. The rest of the story was her generosity. She peeled off a million dollars. She never had any children, but she had stepchildren and nieces and nephews. She gave eight of them $125,000 a piece. She gave, I think, a half a million to her church. And then she continued to invest for another 10 years very wisely. And Pauline died in, I believe it was uh, 19, uh, in 2000, I think she died. And she began to wonder about what she would do with her wealth because she didn't have any really close heirs that needed the money. And I put her in touch with an attorney and he arranged for her at her death to make a gift to the Winston-Salem Foundation. So she ended up giving a gift to the Winston-Salem Foundation of about $3 million. Since then, they have paid out about $3 million in gifts, about 150000 a year for 20 years. The corpus is still slightly bigger than it was when she started, but her generosity has funded a new room on the Ronald McDonald House, lots and lots of other charities. And I just think that's a great story of the benevolence 
that came from one little person who worked very hard and saw something that she accomplished in her lifetime that meant a great deal to a lot of other people. In the Winston-Salem Foundation office, there's a Pauline Carter conference room with her name on the door as a tribute to her. And she'll not be forgotten in Winston-Salem for a long, long time. Oh, that's amazing. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a testament to what one person can do. Well, Jane, I appreciate you taking the time for meet with us on uh, Meet Your Local Heroes. Um, I look forward to seeing you again and uh, getting together uh, since we're right here in Charlotte and we'll get together and have that coffee like you and I had promised. Okay, look forward to it. So if you would like to schedule Gene Hoots or any of our other local heroes for your next event, contact Hey Red Speakers Agency or visit the website at heyred.biz. Now, while you're there, click on the Getting Started button to see how you too can become a local hero. We appreciate you taking the time to watch Meet Your Local Heroes. Click on the subscribe button so you'll know when new interviews are added and maybe we'll see you here on Meet Your Local Heroes. I'm Phil Earhart. Go out and make it a wonderful day today.